my pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker today, my friend and colleague, Dr. Gary Pickering, who's a professor of wine science in the Department of Biological Sciences here at Brock, and also one of our core researchers uh, within the Institute. Uh, Gary holds uh, his doctorate in wine science from Lincoln University uh, in Canterbury, uh, New Zealand. Uh, from there, he moved on to uh, become a lecturer at Charles Sturt University in Australia, uh, then became a senior lecturer and researcher um, at the Eastern Institute of Technology in New Zealand before we were finally able to lure him away uh, from, from his home uh, to make Canada his new home here at Brock University. Uh, his research is focused on uh, wine flavor and sensory science, as well as developing novel uh, wine products and, and processes. Uh, collectively, Gary's uh, an avid publisher, has published over 100 papers, patents, book chapters, conference proceedings, uh, and is currently working on a, a few additional uh, books and book chapters in his uh, spare time. He's also a very active member within our grape and wine community locally. Uh, and he uh, has membership on uh, several industry and professional bodies, including uh, the Vintners uh, Quality Alliance Standards and Development Committee, and also uh, the BQA Experts Tasting Panel. He's also a, a North American editor of the Journal of Food, Agriculture, and Environment, and a member of the Hon Honorary Editorial Board for the International Journal of Wine Research. Uh, among his many, many accomplishments, Gary is also the inventor of the white wine mouthfeel wheel, co-developer of the wine aroma kits, and distributor of the wine defects uh, wheel uh, for both wine and, and beer. Uh, in addition to his work as president of Pixson International, uh, Gary also serves as an international wine judge, and most recently uh, uh, served that role at Cuvée and Interven. And uh, I'd be remiss if I also didn't add that, uh, of course, he always uh, um, or occasionally enjoys a glass of wine. Uh, so with that, uh, Gary's going to speak to us today about one of his more recent uh, research areas that he's working on uh, in terms of taste genetics. Gary? Thank you very much, uh, Debbie. And uh, it's certainly a privilege to be here again. And uh, congratulations to both you and to Natalie for organising such a successful seminar series. It's been, uh, it's been splendid. Super tasters, winemakers, and other freaks. My title is not intended to, uh, to offend any key constituents uh, in our community, or well, maybe it is. What I'm um, really focusing on here is the sensitivity and the flavour perception of super tasters and winemakers. And I want to make the argument that they are atypical, they are different in terms of their palates and their flavour sensitivities. And in that sense, uh, I use the word freak. Having <laughs> just offended winemakers, we may as well um, stir up any Puritans in the audience and show some, uh, some soft porn. Viticulturalists, grape growers, and other evildoers will often tell you that, that wine quality starts in the vineyard, that what they do with grapes in terms of viticultural practice and so on is what dictates wine quality. Us sensory scientists know better. Assessment of wine quality is in the sensory domain. Perception of wine quality is about taste physiology and about what happens uh, up here. And this little fella uh, bears some witness to that. He's called a sensory homunculus. What it is is a representation of what our body would look like proportionally uh, if parts were to grow uh, relative to the area in the cortex that is dedicated to their sensory perception. Mm -hmm. So we can see one of the most striking features about this fella uh, is in fact uh, his lips, his tongue, the whole oral cavity. It's huge. A lot of the cortex is dedicated to, uh, to receiving and interpreting signals from the mouth. It's all about taste, it's all about flavour perception. I guess grapes do play a minor part, I'll, I'll branch you that in, uh, in wine quality. Okay, so what I want to cover off today uh, is to start with the definition of taste and olfaction and smell uh, and also what we mean by flavour. 
I want to talk about this idea of taste phenotypes, define what it is and why it might be important to uh, the wine community. I want to discuss in particular what is called prop taster status, which is one type of, of taste phenotype, uh, and look at how people's taste perception uh, and also their perception of alcoholic beverages depends upon one's prop taster status. Again, I'll define these terms in more detail shortly. I'll then move on to look at some work um, uh, also from our lab that looks at uh, alcohol liking or liking of alcoholic beverages and why that might be important in terms of how it varies with one's taste phenotype. Then we'll finally get on to these freaks known as winemakers and look at how prop interacts with, interacts with their palates and I'll finish with uh, some thoughts uh, on the context of, uh, of this work and also where we're going with further studies. First and foremost, us professors don't do any work. We all know it's the students that do the work. They do the hard yards and, and produce the data that makes us look good. It's important to acknowledge uh, all these students uh, who have been uh, through my lab, in some cases, um, shared labs with colleagues here at Brock for, for their outstanding work. A range of, of folks from uh, undergraduate honours students in the biology program and the psychology programs at Brock uh, through to uh, PhD students. About three quarters of uh, what we're talking about today uh, is stuff from Martha Bajek's uh, PhD pro uh, project but others have made very important contributions. If not to what we're talking about today, in general terms, in terms of looking at taste phenotypes uh, uh, in our lab. This work has also been supported um, to varying degrees by uh, many faculty and staff, both here at Brock uh, and at other uh, universities in North America. And of course, we couldn't do anything without the financial support, in this case of NSERC, uh, of Wine Council, uh, Wine uh, Country Ontario, and other organisations. So flavour, much of the talk we get around flavour, let's define what flavour is. First of all, it's a psychological construct, it happens up here, and it's about signals received here in the whole cavity in the mouth. It's an amalgam, it's a construct of inputs from three different sources. The basic tastes, olfaction or smell, and tactile sensations. Those three modes of sensing a wine or any other product const constitute flavour. So just to review what we mean by tastes, there are five-ish basic tastes, we thought there were four. There are certainly at least five and likely there's going to be somewhere uh, just short of ten basic tastes when uh, sensory physiologists have, have finished, um, uh, finished their investigations. Sweetness, acidity, also called sourness, bitterness, saltiness and umami. The jury is still out about uh, fatty acid taste and there are some other marginal taste qualities such as metallic which may eventually be accepted uh, as, uh, as basic tastes. But they're limited to somewhere between 5 and 10 uh, basic taste qualities. That contrasts with olfaction, fancy term for smell. It contrasts in many ways, one of which is the number of compounds that we are sensitive to as humans uh, in the smell domain. There are well over 10,000 different odorants that we can detect and respond to. Again, in contrast to a much smaller number uh, when, when we're talking about tastings. Also sensitivity. Typically you need um, concentrations of these tastings that are in the microgram or gram per litre range before you can taste them. When it comes to smell, uh, we're talking about parts per million, parts per billion, parts per trillion, tiny, tiny concentrations uh, are required and we can sense those. So we're very sensitive to smell, much more so than taste. There are two different ways of smelling, and these will come up again when we, we, we look at some of our, our data. One is called orthonasal uh, olfaction or aroma. The other is called retronasal. Orthonasal is um, when we pick up a glass of wine, for instance, and smell the wine. That is orthonasal olfaction. The odorants are being driven into the headspace, 
uh, into the, uh, the vapor phase and they're, they're uh, being transferred to an area directly behind the nose, known as the olfactory epithelium. You smell the beautiful floral bouquet of the Gewurztraminer. That is orthonasal olfaction. Retronasal olfaction is still smell, but it's smell that happens when the, when the wine or the sample is in the mouth and has been swallowed. So when we look at, a, again, a glass of, um, a glass of Cabernet Sauvignon and talk about the wonder, wonderful uh, taste of cigar box or of tobacco or of ripe berries, what we're describing is smell. That's retronasal smell. Those same molecules that we picked up on the nose in the mouth are being transferred through the back of the esophagus up and they stimulate the same um, olfactory tissues uh, as when we do an oral, oral nasal evaluation. So two different ways of smelling, orthonasal and retronasal. The final component of flavour is tactile sensations and they're also called uh, chemesthetic sensations. These are important to uh, a number of products but wine flavour in particular. So things like astringency, that dry puckering sensation of a, of a young Cabernet Franc wine, for instance, is an astringent sensation. The heat of alcohol, of ethanol, the cool sensation of, uh, of menthol gum, um, prickling sensation of sparkling wine, uh, pain, irritation. These are called tactile sensations, uh, and the pathways are slightly different, uh, but they're still important components of what we, uh, what we call flavour. I promise this will be the only physiology lesson that, uh, that we have today. I want to look at just the basics of how taste and smell work. Um, human tongue, a bunch of raised mounds of tissue on the tongue called papillae. So if you get up nice and cosy to your neighbour um, or your partner tonight uh, at home, get them to stick out their tongue, get right up there and have a close look. Use a magnifying glass if you want. What you'll see is a bunch of, of raised tissues above the plane of the tongue. They're papillae, and within those papillae, we find the taste buds themselves, and the taste buds have projections um, uh, of receptor cells where taste compounds are bind to. So papillae house taste buds. Within those taste buds are taste cells that um, sugar or an acid or a salt can bind to and start that whole process of perception. By contrast, smell or olfaction um, happens up here. If we, we smell a glass of wine, uh, the odorant rich uh, air uh, goes, is, is um, taken in and is swirled around by some bony structures called turbinates, and they direct that air to these projections here in the olfactory epithelium. Same thing happens when we swallow, except the root is slightly, uh, slightly different. And these are the cilia, the, the uh, projections, the actual um, structures that odor compounds bind to that start the whole process of, ah, it smells foxy, oh, no, it, smell, it smells oaky. So, flavor physiology 101. Let's move on to um, differences in taste perception, differences in flavor perception. The sensory community is, uh, is known for a long time that people differ in their perception of taste or flavour. We just haven't had a great idea about why that is the case. So here's an example of some early work uh, dating back, I think, to the 50s, um, in which we have uh, 10 different judges here, or different individuals, identified just by uh, their initials. And here we have a measure of their sensitivity. The details of how it's measured are not critical, but essentially the, the higher one's score, the less the sensitive one is. And for each individual, we've got four bars. And moving from left to right, it's one's sensitivity for, for salt or sour or sweet or bitter. We can see that the shape and the size of those, those bar, bars are quite different for those individuals. Two sort of general themes. First of all, there's a bunch of people that seem to have quite low values. That means they are very sensitive to these taste compounds. And there's a few individuals, perhaps DH is a good example, who have very high values. They are, in this case, two or three times less sensitive. They need two or three times more of the taste before they can detect a difference. The other thing that this early work shows us uh, is that 
the mode of sensing uh, also can give us different uh, sensitivity. So this, this fella here, uh, FH, we can see a very high bar for, uh, for bitterness. He or she needs a bucket load of bitterance before they can detect uh, a, a stimulus as being bitter. Uh, perhaps in contrast with DH, uh, who is pretty consistent in terms of the, the dose, uh, but perhaps is less sensitive to, to sour compounds. So differences between people in overall um, intensity uh, and also in terms of uh, different taste modalities uh, being perceived uh, as uh, less or more intense. That sort of brings up this idea of the taste phenotype, which is where a lot of the work in our lab has been focused over the last, uh, the last few years. The idea that there might be um, uh, a bunch of traits in terms of taste um, sensitivities that can be called a phenotype and that have a biological or genetic basis. So the central idea for the last four or five years that, um, that this portion of uh, our research program has been following uh, is this. The perceived flavour of food and beverages strongly influences our liking. It seems pretty commonsensical. Liking in turn, how much we like something, strongly influences what we consume and how much we consume. In fact, next to price, it is the main determinant of what we, what we consume in the Western world. Food and beverage consumption uh, is linked to a range of diet-related uh, disease risk and nutritional uh, outcomes. We can think of uh, obesity and type 2 diabetes and uh, coronary heart disease and alcoholism. These are diseases uh, linked to what and how much we take into our body of various food, food beverages. <coughs> Excuse me. Therefore, it follows that differences between individuals in uh, their perception of flavour might associate with disease risk um, and, and other, uh, other risk factors. Of course, that should be of interest to nutritionists and epidemiologists, it is. But I also uh, think that the differences between people and flavour perception uh, should be of interest to the wine and beverage industry. So I think it creates opportunities for uh, product formulation, for branding and for marketing um, uh, decisions and, uh, and segmentations. And we'll talk more about that shortly. We know from uh, previous research that much of the differences between people and their perception of flavour, of uh, food in particular, uh, is related to genetic or, and or biological uh, conditions. And one, uh, one such uh, genetic uh, linked trait called the prop taster phenotype is uh, uh, looked interesting to us and had not been explored deeply in terms of alcoholic beverages. People had looked at this phenotype in relation to food preferences, food liking, food perception, but, but much less so in terms of uh, alcohol or wine perception. So that's what we're focused on um, of, of late. So we'll define this thing called PROP shortly. Um, it's simply an acronym for uh, a compound called 16 propothyrosol So you can see why we use the acronym PROP. And we can assess uh, one's prop status by giving people this chemical. And we can deliver it in two ways. One is to soak a uh, filter paper disc in the compound and to place it on someone's tongue. And the second, uh, more accurate way is to make up some water solutions of this compound and have people uh, try the, 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 the solution and rate its intensity. Let me bring some prop discs with me so that you, you too can play and have a, have a taste. But unfortunately, we used the last of them uh, uh, last week. So, 6N propothyrosol is a compound that's not found in nature. It's actually an antithyroid um, uh, medication. But what's really interesting about this prop phenotype is the responses you get when you give people prop. About a quarter of the population, at least the um, uh, white uh, Caucasian population, about a quarter of people will taste nothing at all. You give them bucket loads of prop. I think it tastes like water or tastes like a blank filter disc. 
about half of the pop, and they're called prop non-tasters. They don't taste prop. About half of the population are called prop medium tasters. That is, you give them the prop solution, and they find it somewhat bitter. Not awful, not absent, just somewhat bitter. And the remaining quarter of the population are called prop super tasters, and they go ballistic. They find it absolutely intense, uh, very aversive, uh, and uh, can seldom come back to the lab. <laughs> there are standardised ways to um, uh, to designate people into these three groups, but that's that's the simple um, overview. Sensitivity to this compound prop means we can categorise people according to prop taster status, you are a super taster, a medium taster, or a non-taster. Well that in itself is not very interesting because this compound is not found in nature anyway, so who cares? The interesting bit is that it turns out that your responsiveness to prop ends up being a very good proxy or indicator of your general taste sensitivity. That is, if you're a prop super taster, you tend to find any taste more intense. Not just bitterness. If I give you a, a sugar solution, or if I give you a salt solution, and you're a prop super taster, it also will be very intense for you. And of course, the reverse is the case with prop non tasters. So here we have a fairly rapid and easily administered test for assessing a population's uh, general taste sensitivity or taste responsiveness. That's the cool thing about this taste phenotype. Up until recently, this was the only way to, uh, to assess one's prop status. We didn't know the underlying genetics. We now have a much better idea, and um, the TR38 gene uh, codes for the prop taste receptor. And it explains much of um, the, taste, the prop taste phenotype. Not all of it, but, but much of it. Uh, essentially, um, for those who are interested, if you have this particular um, allele, you're a non-taster. If you have this uh, uh, heterozygous form, you're a medium taster. If you have this uh, allele, you are a super taster. That explains most, not all, of the prop story. In fact, some work here at Brock, um, Amanda Bering and, uh, and Ping Yang uh, helped also to elucidate some of this, uh, uh, this, these results. Another interesting phenomena is that if you're a prop super taster, or rather, as your prop sensitivity increases, we also find that you're more likely to have more papillae on your tongue. Papillae, of course, house the taste buds. So more papillae mean more taste buds, which means more signal uh, for a given you know, concentration of sourness or bitterness or whatever. So this is another separate mechanism whereby, for instance, prop super tasters may uh, experience everything, every taste, more, more intensely. So what? Does it have anything more than an academic interest? I think so. In terms of food, uh, food behaviour, there have been numerous studies, I've just cited some of them here now, um, that show your prop taster status has implications uh, for food preferences. So for instance, if you, are, um, if you are more responsive to prop, i.e. you're a medium taster or a super taster, you, turn, you tend to not like cruciferous Cruciferous vegetables. They're the ones that are bitter, the, bro the broccoli, um, uh, broccoli, for instance. You also tend to have lower liking for citrus fruit and, interestingly, uh, fat. There's also other, other uh, products uh, that I haven't listed here. So, implications for food preference and food consumption. So, for instance, we find that, super ta um, that elderly super tasting woman. Uh, have higher serum lipid levels uh, in, in, their, in their blood. Uh, I'm sorry, have lower serum lipid levels in their blood. They find they experience fat very intensely. They find that aversive. They eat less um, uh, dairy and, and high fat products. That's the working hypothesis to explain lower um, uh, lipid serum levels in, in this population. There's also some evidence. Um, it's equivocal. Um, some research says yes, some says no, but on balance, most of the research shows a link between prop status and risk of alcoholism. And it tends to be a protective um, uh, property. That is, the more sensitive you are to prop, 
the less likely you are to de develop some forms of alcoholism. And we'll put more about the implications of that uh, shortly. And there are other health consequences that the literature shows us. Again, um, if you have lower prop sensitivity, if you're a non-taster, and some work has shown that you are at increased risk of some types of cancer, uh, you're likely to have a larger body mass index, uh, you're also likely to be more prone to some types of cardiovascular disease, and you're more likely to be a smoker. And again, there is um, equivocation in the literature. There are some studies that don't show this, uh, but the majority do indicate some health outcomes related to diet choices related to your flavour sensitivity or perception. So that's kind of cool and interesting. What we wanted to do was to take it into the realm of wine and alcoholic beverages in general, which hadn't been well investigated. So this is the first basic research question that we framed. Um, does prop taster status, whether or not you're a super taster or non-taster, does that associate with perception of simple taste stimuli uh, that are important in wine and alcohol? So things like uh, sweetness, for instance, and astringency, you know, are important in wine perception. Um, uh, might we find those attributes differ in these different uh, prop taste taster groups? So the overview of, of the of the study uh, was this: we took 126 participants, uh, we gave them a variety of uh, of stimuli, um, citric acid for sourness, sucrose uh, for sweetness sodium chloride for saltiness and so on, uh, at different concentrations. We also, um, as part of a, a separate study, uh, looked at um, their perception of temperature in the mouth, which I won't talk about uh, today. We use this scale here, which is called a generalized labeled magnitude scale. It's a fancy scale that psychologists have been developing and fine-tuning for decades. Um, it's claim to fame as it allows valid comparisons between let's say my taste perception and your taste perception. Um, it accounts for um, the differences in our use of the scale, it accounts for differences in our life experiences. That's uh, why people will use this scale for comparing people's sensory um, perceptions. We did fancy things with the data um, in terms of normalization and standardization, but as it turns out, it doesn't matter what you do with the data, the results still look the same. This is, uh, this is one summary uh, graph of those results, and uh, I want to walk you through it. What we have here is uh, the intensity, the normalized intensity, um, of the different stimuli. Along the x-axis, we have the different uh, stimuli. So these are given to people in water. This is a low concentration of an astringent, a high concentration of an astringent, uh, a low concentration of a compound that elicits metallic flavor. Metallic flavor is something that is important uh, in, in wine. Uh, a high concentration um, of metallic flavor. A bitterant, a sweetener, a salt, a sour. And this, these are different temperatures um, in the mouth. But we'll focus on this here. What you can see consistently, I'm oh, sorry, with the yellow bars, the yellow bars are non-tasters, the blue bars are medium tasters, and the red bars are super tasters. Same pattern throughout these different stimuli. That is, that the red bars are much higher than the other two bars. Super tasters for all these taste and tactile stimuli are, that are relevant to wine are rating the intensity much higher than medium tasters or, or non-tasters. So that was kind of cool. Um, and it was written up uh, um, a couple of years ago uh, in Physiology and Behaviour, and here's the the reference if you want to, uh, to dive more deeply into that, uh, that study. Uh, as I say, Martha has just finished her PhD. Uh, she's now a sensory scientist with, uh, with Philip Morris uh, International in Switzerland and uh, doing great things over there. So our second question was this. Okay, that's, that, that's fine. Within the, the taste realm, it looks like wine-relevant uh, stimuli uh, are perceived differently by the different prop taster groups. What about retronasal aroma? For so much of wine flavour is in fact about retronasal aroma. Going back to the example, the, the tobacco, um, uh, the taste of tobacco or cigar box or dark berry fruit on the palate, those, th that's all about olfaction, retronasal olfaction, not taste. So the question was this, 
do the prop taster groups differ in their perception of retronasal uh, odorants? Our expectation was, was this. We thought, well, this whole prop story is about um, taste receptors and about uh, uh, taste bud density. Therefore, smelly compounds should have nothing to do with that. Therefore, retronasal odour should not, um, shouldn't matter what your prop status is, you'll still smell it the same. But if we add a tasted or an astringent compound into that odour mixture, then maybe we'll see higher ratings uh, in the prop super tasters because we know they perceive taste and astringency more intensely. That was our, our expectation. Duh, you're wrong, but it sounded like a reasonable thing to, uh, to hypothesise. So what we did uh, in terms of experimental was we took um, uh, 15 uh, non-tasters, medium tasters and super tasters, matched as best we could in terms of uh, gender and demographics. And we trained them and we had them assess the intensity of three different odorants uh, at three different concentrations uh, in, in triplicate. We chose odorants that were wine relevant. So the three odorants were uh, diacetyl, Diacetyl is responsible for the, the yummy butter characters in a, um, in a Chardonnay, for instance. Uh, we chose uh, terpene, uh, minimal, which is responsible for some of the floral and floral citrus notes in aromatic varieties like Everts Tremina and, of course, our wonderful uh, Niagara Riesling. And we also chose um, acetaldehyde, which is a fermentation um, uh, byproduct. It's found um, in, in most wines um, and can reach very high concentrations in styles like sherry or more oxidised uh, wines. So three different um, uh, odorants important to wine, three different chemical groups, uh, three different concentrations. Here were the conditions. Had people rate the smell orthonasally of these different odorants? We had them rate the smell retronasally once it's been in the mouth. And we had them rate right, the retronasal uh, smell in the presence of an astringent. We put an astringent in that glass. We also put a bitterant in that glass. So, uh, cat, a heavy catechin, which happens to be a wine compound anyway. And our expectations were, were in these two conditions that super tasters may in fact report higher retronasal intensity because of that integration process of flavour that happens here. And retronasally, uh, we expected find no, uh, no difference. And for those who are not familiar with the sensory lab uh, uh, here at, uh, at Covey, this is um, one portion of it. We have uh, 14 uh, individual sensory booths in which panellists or judges do their work. We control the lighting, we control the, the temperature, the humidity, uh, the noise. Um, uh, so these sorts of um, biases or influences don't, uh, don't affect people's ratings. We have a computerised uh, system, so direct data entry into the computer, which allows for quick uh, compilation of results uh, and feedback to the participants. Uh, and this is the typical setting for this particular study. And uh, here's a, um, a, a lady doing her assessment in this case for orthonasal aroma. This is the scale that she would see on the screen. She, in this case, would smell the glass and uh, use this scale to rate how intense she found, uh, uh, she found the stimulus. So what we find, this is the result for the three different prop phenotypes. So the intensity of, of the odorants, I've averaged these, these across all odorants, all concentrations and all replicates, because the data looks the same. Um, and the, regardless of which odor we're talking about, um, the data looks the same. So these are averaged um, responses. In this case, this is um, retronasal odor or smell in the presence of the astringent. Sure enough, non-tasters and super-tasters are down here, and there's a, a modest but significant increase in ratings for super-tasters. So, we're clever, we were right. In the presence of an astringent, super-tasters will rate retronasal odour more intensely. This is not a dumping effect. Uh, we also have judges um, uh, rate astringency and other attributes so that we don't get a dumping, what's called a dumping effect. This is straight uh, uh, odour intensity. This is the retronasal uh, odorants in the prison of a bitterant, catechin. And the same, uh, same pattern was not, not significant, although if you play enough with the numbers and use things like contrast analysis, you do get significance coming out. 
that the same pattern of supertasters rating the retronasal odour more intensely than the other two groups in the presence, in this case, of tasting bitterant. But this is the retronasal only, an odorant on its own, no taste at all, just the odorant in the mouth, same pattern, supertasters rating it higher. Hmm. So we were wrong, but it's curious. The bottom line is, for retronasal odour, which is, like, um, uh, you know, I'd argue probably three quarters of what um, wine flavour is all about, for retronasal odour of wine-relevant compounds, it doesn't matter what you stick in their mouths, they're going to rate it as being more intense. You don't need the concurrent presentation of a bitter or, or a tactile uh, stimulant. Really interesting. That, uh, that work was completed by uh, Gina Haverstock. Um, Gina's now a very successful uh, winemaker in um, uh, Gasparo Vineyards in, uh, in Nova Scotia. Uh, and also uh, valuable input from David uh, uh, DiBattista, who was a, a professor of psychology here at Brock. Okay, so the next question is, that's all fine. You've shown in a, in a simple aqueous solution that prop super tasters rate simple tasters more intensely. They rate tactile compounds more intensely. They rate retronasal odours more intensely. What about the real world? What about real wine or real alcoholic beverages? How do they perceive those? So we chose wine because wine is bitter and it's hot. Um, and it elicits tactile sensations, three things that we know from the simple aqueous solutions um, uh, uh, are important in prop super tasting. And I work for a wine institute and best keep the boss happy, so wine was our, our, our medium of, uh, of choice. Uh, we chose three commercial um, red wines, uh, two from Europe from memory and one, one uh, local Pinot Noir. Uh, and we had people trained to um, rate the major sensations in those wines um, and then we let them loose on the label magnitude scale and then we determined their prop status using uh, standard means. And here's what we got. This is perceived intensity. Uh, we have uh, the, the clear bar being the non-tasters, the grey bar being the medium tasters and the dark bar being the super tasters. And for the red wine, there are three, three dominant um, attributes, bitterness, astringency, and sourness, and these are the ratings. What we see in this case is um, it's not the, the super tasters that differ, it's the non-taster. So non-tasters are rating the dominant sensations in red wine as significantly less intense than the other two taste phenotypes, medium tasters uh, and super tasters. Just to pull one of those results apart so we can look at it more closely. Uh, it's a pretty messy graph, isn't it? Uh, this is the perceived astringency intensity. And here are the three wines that we used. Uh, an Italian Bel Palicella, a Canadian Pinot Noir, and a, a cheap, uh, crappy uh, uh, South France blend. And uh, again, it doesn't matter what we use, you can see the pattern is the same. Super tasters and this, uh, rather non tasters were rating the astringency of all these three wines a lot lower uh, than the rest. One thing to note is that the scale that we're using, the label magnitude scale, is a, is a quasi logarithmic scale. What that means is that these differences are actually a lot bigger than if it had been a normal analog scale. These are very significant differences in the intensity of ratings. So that's cool. The basic, basic tastes and sensations that red wine elicit will give us uh, do matter in terms of the taste phenotype. That's fine, um, but if you listen to wine writers or, or wine connoisseurs, they're always prepping on with these very complex terms and nuances in terms of how they describe wine, typically more than just sour and sweet, as our two uh, mosquitoes uh, um, are also prone to prepping on about the, about the blood in this case. So what we did was, um, as part of a separate study, we, uh, which we were rate, looking at the effect of uh, lactic acid bacteria on how it might change uh, the astringency qualities of red wine, we also thought we would uh, determine the prop status of our, our judges. And what we, found, uh, what we found was this, that 
And I've only pulled some of the results here. The trend was, the result was the same for uh, nine out of the ten properties. So we trained people for many weeks to be able to break down mouthfeel into its um, constituent parts. And you often hear silky tannins or coarse tannins, or you often hear about uh, grippy adhesive wines or smooth wines. Or we can train people to um, consistently um, rate these sub-qualities of astringency. We did that. There were 10 sub-qualities. And, um, and then we, uh, in this case, uh, had them taste, uh, it was 15, uh, no, it was 16 different commercial red wines. So a very large data set. The results were the same regardless of what wine. So again, averaged them across all 16 wines, uh, two replicates. We can see that prop super tasters, and there are no, no medium tasters in this trial, prop super tasters were rating things as more intense for these sub -qualities. What do these stand for? Again, these are just to illustrate um, particulate in mouth. So um, the perception of the size of the particle in the mouth that, of that drying sensation. Um, in mouth and after, after expectoration, after you spit. We make our judges spit, there's no swallowing. Um, Smoothness um, versus coarseness in mouth after expectoration, grippy adhesive properties, mouth coat properties. Again, there were numerous other sub qualities. It didn't matter what you trained people to measure, if they were super tasters, then their response to red wine for these mouthfeel qualities were more intense um, or qualitatively different than the non tasters. That, that earlier study uh, was conducted by um, uh, Katarina and also uh, David, and you can find that reference uh, here in Food Quality and Preference. And that uh, last uh, mouthfeel study was conducted by uh, Gord Robert as part of his, uh, his honours project. He left the lab without giving me a photo, so uh, I uh, improvised there. Um, Gord is, uh, is now a winemaker, chief winemaker at Stony Ridge um, Vineyards, uh, Stony Ridge Cellars in, in Niagara. Okay, so this is interesting. We find in simple aqueous solutions and in real wine, so the prop taster groups differ in their perception of these key um, uh, taste and odor qualities. Does that make a difference in terms of their liking of alcoholic beverages? Does the differences in taste and flavor perception in these group, groups influence their liking of these products? Why? Uh, why might liking be uh, an important attribute to measure? Well, first of all, um, it's, it's often used as an uh, indicator of preference. You can determine people's uh, preferences based on their liking scores. And that, have, that has implications, of course, for product formulation, for branding, um, and for marketing opportunities. If, in fact, the prop taster groups differed in their preferences for different, let's say, wine products. And, uh, and also, more speculatively, but um, of equal interest, is that liking is a potential measure of consumption. So in the nutrition field, more and more researchers are having people rate their liking of different foods um, and using that as a proxy for how much they eat of a particular food. Why is that? Well, traditional measures of self-reporting one's diet and food behavior um, tend to be uh, fully inaccurate. It can be experimental bias, there can be memory or recall issues, there can be a lack of willingness to be honest to oneself or to the experimenter, and so more people are using liking uh, as a measure of actual consumption. We speculate, it's a big speculation, no one's looked at this to my knowledge, that if that same principle applies to alcoholic beverages, then liking scores may in fact be also an indicator of consumption levels uh, for alcohol and who knows, potentially, risk of alcohol abuse and alcoholic behaviour. So liking was an interesting thing to, to go after and to measure, and it's relatively simple to, uh, to do that. So have we had a go at what winemakers, viticulturalists, Puritans, who may have a go at any Catholics in the room now? Pontifications. Why expect that alcohol preference or consumption might vary, or might change? Um, uh, as, a, as a function of prop sensitivity. Well, first of all, we have seen this, this happen with foods uh, in the past. Um, there's some, some evidence, although again it's uh, critical that, uh, that we do have this 
a protective relationship between uh, prop sensitivity and risk of alcohol, uh, some types of alcoholism. And we speculate that if all this is true, this might be the mechanism. Essentially, alcohol is, is bitter and hot, two very aversive uh, properties. We innately, as humans, reject bitterness um, and, and heat and other trigeminal stimulations in the mouth. We find them unpleasant. And so if prop super tasters experience these more intensely, maybe they'll find alcoholic beverages more aversive or tend to drink less. Or the counter argument is rubbish. They still enjoy a beer, they'll still drink, but they'll simply change how they take their alcohol. They'll add um, um, sweeteners. They'll have a rum and coke rather than a rum, for instance, to, mod to modify uh, their taste differences. So it's interesting uh, speculations. Uh, what we did was to take 123 uh, alcohol drinking participants from Brock uh, University student and staff populations. You might think it's pretty hard to find 123 uh, students that, uh, that, that drink, um, but it wasn't. We, we had a good sign up rate for <laughs> Uh, for this, uh, this, this trial. There's, there's the basic um, description of this, uh, of this panel um, and standard measures for classifying people according to their prop status. This is a simple hedonic scale. Uh, it looks a bit messy on this over here. Um, I've just pulled out three of the beers that we looked at, but people have given a long list of products. And they simply tick which box corresponds to their liking. How much do you like ale? I like extremely through to dislike extremely. And also some options here if they've never tried it before. Uh, and that, that, those, those boxes are converted to a, a number from one to seven. We can then perform uh, uh, parametric statistics on that. So that's how we collected the data. Um, with so many products though, you don't want to be running um, um, hundreds of, of different analyses. And so we can, these are the products here. We collapse them into obvious categories to make uh, data management a little bit simpler. A pretty comprehensive list of uh, different types of bills. What do we see? Well, this, this data is still being worked out. Uh, again, I apologise that graph is, uh, is, is not clear uh, at all. What we have here, the first uh, eight or nine uh, categories are the different groupings of alcoholic beverages. And what we find, um, well, there are some that are significant, but the pattern is the same. Not large, but these white bars, which are medium tasters, are higher than the other two bars, which are non-tasters and super tasters. And in fact, when you, when you look at individual beverages rather than just calling them spirits, you find that a lot of these individual products, and these are some of them, come out as being significant. The pattern is the same right across the board, that prop medium tasters are rating their liking for alcoholic beverages higher than the other two taste phenotypes, regardless of what type of alcoholic beverage it is. It certainly wasn't what we were expecting. Why? Don't know. One, one, one idea that Martha has put forward, and I think it has, um, it has some traction, is um, what we might call the best of both worlds hypothesis. That is that proper medium tasters uh, don't find the heat or the bitterness of alcoholic beverages aversive, but they are picking up the complexities of, uh, of alcohol. Alcohol is a very complex uh, uh, product. So they're finding the concentrations um, to be complex rather than aversive. So the best of both worlds uh, is, is, uh, is one thought to explain these results. And certainly the, um, the thing that strikes us most, and again this is just some of the data, is that this pattern is the same for any beverage you choose to, to ask the question of. Medium taste is rating it higher. Of course, if that, that translates into actual consumption levels, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, result. The last question, the last study that we went after, and it was more just an academic indulgence on my part, and a side bet, bet with a colleague that I ended up losing it again, uh, what was this. Um, we know that your prop taste of status influences your perception of taste and flavour. It would be interesting to know whether or not wine consumers um, tend to be, uh, if their distribution of prop taster groups is different to wine experts or winemakers. For instance, wouldn't it be interesting if winemakers 
we're more likely to be prop non-tasters compared to the folks that are making the wine for the wine consumers. We thought it would be an interesting um, thing to test out. It wasn't really something we uh, uh, put much credence in, but the more I think about the, these results, the more I think it's uh, uh, maybe saying something quite profound about, uh, about this, uh, this subject. So it was simply a convenience uh, survey uh, when people came on campus for various uh, wine events here at Cuppy. We took them aside and we gave them a filter paper disc and determined their proper status and had them complete um, some questionnaires about their, uh, their liking for different types of, uh, of beverages uh, as well as some additional questions that, uh, that I won't get into today. We asked them about their level of involvement with wine and that enabled us to classify the respondents in terms of are you a, you know, an average wine consumer um, or are you what we could call a wine expert. Uh, and this is the breakdown of these two cohorts. The wine experts were predominantly winemakers and LCBO product consultants. So I think people that we would agree fit from that wine expert category. What we find was hot off the press. Um, my colleague uh, uh, John Hayes at, uh, at Penn State has just uh, finished sending this across to me. Um, it's a fancy analysis. It's called a con conditional distribution function. It doesn't matter. Let me walk you through it. Along here is prop intensity on a scale of 0 to 100. The blue traces, the blue trace is non experts, so wine consumers. The red trace are wine experts. This is a probability function here, so what's the probability of you being a prop non taster or a prop super taster, for instance? But the key thing here is to look at the red trace. The red trace is higher, so we have three bumps one, two, three which correspond approximately to the three phenotypes, non-tasters, medium tasters, and super tasters. The red trace is higher, much higher here and here. Wine experts are much more likely to be prop medium tasters and super tasters. And conversely, the blue trace is much higher than the red trace at the low end. That means that wine consumers are much more likely to be prop non-tasters than wine experts. Interesting, keep the thinking caps on. I think it's, um, I, I think uh, this result uh, goes deeper. So uh, essentially we summarize these two points already. You could argue this data suggests that people may self-select for specific professions in life based on their sensory ability. You might think that's stretching things a bit far, but in, 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 um, in recent um, uh, dialogue with Linda Bar Barashuk, um, who's a, a pioneer in this field, uh, she reported similar results when she did an informal survey of, um, uh, of students at culinary schools in the, in the US. The students in culinary schools were also more likely to be super tasters than the rest of the population. So I think that result, coupled with this result, give us some credence to this idea of self-selection based on your sensory uh, ability. I think more pragmatically, have a think about this. Now, the wine consumer looks to wine authority figures to take some of the risk out of buying wine. They look to the wine journalist, the wine writer, the elsewhere product consultant for advice on which wines to buy. This is saying that the palate of the person giving you that advice ain't the same as your palate. I think that's quite the quite intriguing. Also, uh, gives us pause to reflect on that adage that winemakers tend to make wine for winemakers. Yeah, they do. It's because they've got it's the same um, flavour and taste sensitivities. So a couple of slides just to, uh, just to sum up. Um, I think just going back to the beginning and looking at the, at the, the key results, we've, we've shown that prop super tasters are more responsive to a wide range of taste and tactile stimuli in, in um, aqueous solutions that extends to retronasal odour, a key part of wine perception. It also extends to um, the dominant sensations found in red wine, stringency, uh, bitterness, sourness, and it extends to those um, more complex sensations of, of mouthfeel and discrimination. Unexpectedly, we found that medium tasters tend to like alcohol more than the other two cohorts. And wine experts are more likely to be super, including winemakers, super tasters or medium tasters than they are non-tasters. 
Ergo, super testers and winemakers were the art freaks. Hear a laugh from the winemaker at the back. So, further research that our lab is, is uh, involved with, um, we're looking at some statistical models to try and better predict um, someone's liking and alcohol consumption based on this and other taste phenotypes, taking into account, ge account gender and wine expertise as well. That's in collaboration with um, uh, John Hayes at Penn State University. Uh, we're looking at um, this question of does that greater liking from medium tasters actually translate into higher use of alcohol and perhaps higher risk of alco alcoholism? That work's been conducted um, in collaboration with uh, Aaron Jane and um, Graham uh, Bizawada from uh, University of Buffalo uh, and also Bev Tepler from uh, Tepa from Britain's University. Uh, and also in collaboration with those colleagues, we're looking at what specific sensory properties of wine might explain the differences between prop super tasters and the rest. I think the money's in this question here that we've just started to get involved with, with our colleagues at Buffalo. We have market segmentation now for wine based on, on gender, uh, based on, on age and other demographics. We also have taste segmentation, we have segmentation rather, based on taste phenotypes. The trick, I think, is to work out how to identify uh, those people and to target um, wine formulation, branding and, and marketing for these different uh, taste phenotypes. And we've got some exciting work that we're, we're um, involved with at the moment. Um, and finally, um, we're also looking at other taste phenotypes, in particular something known as thermal taste, uh, which is, uh, I think, an equally interesting um, genetic-based way of perceiving flavour. So with that, uh, I'm finished, and thank you very much for your time. Hi, Gary. I was wondering whether uh, there were any generalities that you could draw about this on the basis of gender. So the question, just to, to, to repeat it, is are there any general comments that uh, we can make on, on gender? Um, yes, there is, and I, and I should have mentioned this in the beginning. There is a, uh, a gender bias with the prop distribution. That is, women are more likely to be prop super tasters than, than men. It's not a huge difference, but it's a consistent difference we see in the studies. Women are more likely to be prop super tasters. Not good for our egos, I know that one, but it's, it's what it is. Yeah, I kind of thought. I have a question from the live webcast. To what extent have you explored the, the effect of umami on test sensitivity? That's a great question. So the question is to what extent have we looked at umami taste on, on taste sensitivity? And I'm assuming that the, uh, uh, the question is in regard to, um, to taste, taste phenotypes and umami. Um, we haven't done much with umami because there's no evidence um, that, in my view, um, there never will be. Uh, any evidence that umami is, is important in wine perception. If you look at the compounds that elicit umami, you don't find them at high concentrations at all in wine. Although I think with wine food pairings, the question becomes much more interesting. Um, uh, Martha did complete a small study looking at, um, looking at umami perception uh, and how that varies with phenotype. Um, the data has been worked up at the moment, uh, so I guess watch this, this space um, as soon as we have some uh, results to talk to, uh, uh, we'll pass them on. Good question. Uh, <clears throat> going back to the graph on the proposed correlation between the sensitivity and liking towards alcohol and beverage, could it be plausible to suggest that those with the more discriminate and insensitive taste might simply be compensating for it by drinking more delicate varieties of the same beverages. I mean, on one hand, the list of the drinks uh, seem to be fairly elaborate. On the other, it's generic as well as a dry white wine, but of course, the range goes greatly from uh, uh, Let's say, if you say dark red, you could be talking about commercial high alcohol content, uh, dark fruit red, and something much more delicate. 
so if I could paraphrase, um, you were asking whether or not we might expect some of the liking differences to be in part due to um, different taster groups being more discriminating in, the, in their tastes of different wines. Which in turn might not affect the actual situation in the response graph since people, for instance, super tasters and non-tasters addressing white wine would not habitually be drinking the same white wine. Great question. I think yes, it's certainly possible. Um, one thing we do that's not a complete answer to your question at all. One thing we do know from the literature is that in terms of, of the technical definition of discrimination, super tasters are able to discriminate finer attributes than, than non-tasters. So this is what we saw, I think, in part with the mouthfeel study, is that finer gradations of differences, let's say in um, uh, smoothness or silkiness, um, were found by super tasters that they are able to discriminate um, smaller sensations. And um, does that translate into, into their liking? Quite possibly. In fact, we are going after that question in part with some of the work uh, uh, with the University of Buffalo. Um, great question.